We live in influential times. I say that because our lives are influenced in one way or another by our beliefs, our environment, and relationships, which either affect or enforce our mindset. In the case of economic models, it's no different. Capitalism, with a wide array of thinkers and practices, has greatly influenced our lives. Hey there audience, I'm Sparks TV, and in today's video I'm going to cover four early capitalist thinkers in this episode of Economic History. As a prelude, the origins of capitalism are debatable. Some say it existed as long as our primitive ancestors, while others would say it existed since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. But I think most of us can agree that there is a big difference between pre-industrial and industrial society. On the other side, primitive life had traits that can be considered capitalist, such as trade, markets, and private property in the case of the tribe. But it wasn't considered an ideology, but mainly practices that were needed in order to survive. When did these practices solidify into an ideology? Well, let's take a look at 18th century Europe. At this time, Europe was going through a time of great questioning. The Enlightenment. What gave the king right to rule? Who even is God? What justifies the feudal structure? Are just a few questions being talked about. As these questions gained prominence, individual thinkers began to ask, what system is to replace feudalism? What role should the government have? How should people make a living? And what model would best represent these Enlightenment ideas? These thinkers and their ideas would go on to form the belief of classical liberalism, or capitalism, which would be a major influence in the Enlightenment, in the economy, and society. At this time, England was a major world power, having colonies across the globe, and with it, major economic power. One who best observed this activity was Adam Smith. According to Mark Skolson in The Three Economists, Smith's system of beliefs can be broken down into four principles. One, prudence, hard work, and benevolence towards our citizens are virtues being encouraged. Two, government should limit itself to law enforcement, enforcing property rights, and limited public works. Three, in government policy of laissez-faire, non-interventionism in the economy. This includes supporting free trade, low taxes, and minimal government interference. And finally, keeping a gold-silver standard to avoid the devaluing of currency and providing a stable monetary environment. So already, Smith has outlined the basics of the capitalist structure. The encouragement of pulling yourself up, having the right to interact in the economy with limited interference. In the case of progress, Smith argued that prosperity and progress will be brought about by a free market, not the state, in what he calls the invisible hand that will guide outcomes. And so, Adam Smith, with his observing of economic activity, will go on to solidify capitalism as an ideology, and solidify his works as the foundation for future economic theories. While Smith has laid the foundation for capitalism, there have been others of his time who further strengthened this model. Meet David Ricardo. If there's one thing Ricardo is best known for, it would be comparative advantage. Comparative advantage is the ability of an individual or group to sell and make specific goods more efficiently than another activity. So, we're talking specialization, right? But there's more to it than that. Under comparative advantage, we have opportunity cost and absolute cost. Opportunity cost is what a person gains from sacrificing something. This still doesn't seem understandable. So let me use a demonstration. We have X and we have Y. X has 10 apples and 4 bananas. Y has 3 apples and 12 bananas. We can see that X and Y are better at producing a specific product. This is what's called the absolute cost. Moreover, X wants to increase its supply of bananas. So X goes over to Y and they trade apples for bananas. And so both sides gain something. To conclude, this theory claims the following. 1. People and countries are better off at producing a specific product rather than a diversity of products. And 2. Specialization will encourage better products and engagement with others, via trade, who are more specialized in producing what someone wants. This creates an environment of cooperation and exchange, or what Ricardo titled, Comparative Advantage. The 
The British Empire, with its economic powers, was the leading country to breed prominent capitalist thinkers. With the exception of one individual, Jean-Baptiste Say. Born in France, Say would be best known for his teachings on entrepreneurship and more prominently, Say's Law, with the motto, Supply Creates Its Own Demand. But let me break it down. When a factory produces goods, it creates consumption. Consumption generates a profit, meaning more investment into production, and more wages. And more wages means more money for people to spend on consumption. To summarize, Say's Law argues that production is key to economic prosperity, not the demand. And the ability to buy an item is dependent on what a person can sell. However, Say's law is a bit rigid, as it doesn't take into consideration the dynamics of consumers' choice, which can lead to a lot of supply and little demand. But if there's one thing we can take from Say's beliefs, it would be this. What you reap will be what you sow. Economics can be described as the study of our relationship to resources, and how do we manage those resources. One such person who best studied this relationship was Thomas Malthus. Malthus, before becoming an economist, was a scholar of demographics, specifically population growth. His magnum opus, an essay on the principle of population, Malthus claims population growth will overcome vital resources, thus leading to a Malthusian trap. Think of Soylent Green, for example. You gotta tell him, Soylent Green is people! To solve this problem, Malthus proposed for people to have late marriages, diversify the economy for more agriculture, and most controversially, the opposition against welfare, such as the poor laws in England, which he claimed only exacerbated population growth. My taxes help to support the public institutions which I have mentioned, and they cost enough. Those who are badly off must go there. Many can't go there, and many would rather die. If they would rather die, perhaps they had better do so and uh, decrease the surplus population. Surely you don't mean that, sir. With all my heart. Okay, maybe not that pessimistic, but he was the first to address the problem of welfare traps. Now, despite Malthus's opposition to Smith's successors, and his predicted apocalypse not coming to pass due to our ability to produce more than we consume, and our access to more education, he did contribute to the economic theory of capitalism, the first one being that we live in a finite world. Because population has to keep in line with resources, there is a need for competition for survival. This justifies hierarchies, claiming it's natural for a state of people to be better off than others. And finally, he helped enforce the idea that people are to make a living by participating in the economy and not living under welfare. In his essay, he writes, If the poor laws never existed in this country, though there might have been instances of severe distress, the aggregate mass of happiness among the common people would have been much greater. To give a summary of these thinkers, I'm going to discuss core traits they all more or less supported, a few critiques, and supporting claims. The most prominent thing they supported was the individual, the self, and everything that enforces the individualism, such as free markets, private property, and minimal government regulation. Even if one is doing a benevolent action, it's still out of a personal gain, stated by Smith in his book Wealth of Nations. Quote, It's not from the benevolence of the butcher, the brewer, or the banker that we expect our dinner, but from their regard to their own interests." End quote. This is combined with a second belief, the law of the harvest, which is the idea that awards are proportional to efforts, or lack thereof. This comes in line with people needing to participate in the economy to reap its benefits, not handouts. These values are already quite sound. However, these values are rigid to say the least. Let me explain. Firstly, they underestimate the need of the collective. If one does something charitable for the sake of personal interests, the receiver will often take that as a sense of camaraderie. Moreover, there is a lot of occasions where group effort is necessary to achieve any results, such as family work, working with co-workers, and to provide empathy for others to better understand each other. Secondly, the law of the harvest tends to rationalize all actions onto the individual. For example, if you have a nice house, you must have worked hard and earned it. And if you don't, then you must have been lazy. This behavior is overlooked by many other influences the individual faces, and its consequences if we do not acknowledge them. And finally, the need for nurture is overlooked. This includes education, decent living, sanitation, good wages, 
healthcare even, are needed to get people a starting point to help their future. Thomas Wells describes this dispute excellently in his thesis, Adam Smith's Bourgeoisie Virtues in Competition. Quote, Up to a point, competition nurtures and supports such virtues as prudence, temperaments, civility, industriousness, and honesty. But there are also various mechanisms by which competition can have a deleterious effects on the institutions and incentives necessary for sustaining even the most commercially friendly of virtues. End quote. But with all said and done, the practices of capitalism, through much trial and error, has become the best option for the advancement of society. The flexibility of the free market has offered a great variety of opportunities to buy and sell, and the ability to create a world where we're more productive and connected. But even in capitalism, there is flaws, which makes the system not perfect, and in some cases, unsustainable. And modern economists are recognizing its limits, and are lurking for some alternatives that will help improve it. Even in the time of Smith and Malthus, there have been people who even called for a complete alternative. Who were these people? Well, that'll be for another time. <laughs>